I want to tell you about this day in 1976 out in the Atlantic Ocean. Let me set the scene for you. We're dealing with a guy here in the left seat of a 747-200 that's owned, by the way, by KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, one of the best in the world then, one of the best in the world today. His name is Jacob Van Zanten. He is the chief pilot for KLM. Not only is he the chief pilot, and he's been around 35 years, but Jacob is a beloved individual. He is a captain's captain. He's a family man. He's somebody that everybody looks up to at KLM. He very seldom gets angry. And when he does, it's a very quiet type of angry. So he's the sort of individual that people can approach, they can talk to. Oh, he's an old style captain, all right. He's a James Kirk. That's what all of us were taught to be. He's in command. He knows what everybody should do. He knows where they should go. And he is spoken to only with respect. And he runs his cockpit in the same tradition of Dutch mariner excellence that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. But Jacob, this particular day, is a very upset guy. The reason he's upset is because he's had to divert into a place he didn't want to go. See, the chief pilot has to fly every now and then, just like the, you know, the director of the medical staff has to stay current. And he's gotten out and gone in a 747, and he's taken this charter down to the Canary Islands, and he's going to turn around, pick up another group of passengers, take them back to Amsterdam. Then he'll get off, go back to the office, and somebody else will fly the airplane on. Except it's not working that way. Murphy has gotten in the works. And there's been a bomb threat over at Las Palmas, which is the main airport of the Canary Islands. So he's had to divert, along with several other airplanes, to another airfield at slightly higher altitude, only one runway. It's kind of short, and it's fog-bound today. It's not really fog. It's clouds blowing across the runway. But it's just the same. He's had trouble getting his fuel. He's had trouble getting out of there. And he's about to run out of a thing we call crew duty time. This is the maximum amount of time that an air crew may remain on duty before we've got to put them to bed to get them some rest. I know this is a completely foreign concept to healthcare. <laughs> By the way, we've got to make this not be a foreign concept to healthcare because it's physiologically. <laughs> and, it's physiologically absurd to have people on duty too long. I don't want anyone operating on me that way or even dealing with me, neither do you. We know that, but we've got to change this and it's money involved. It's money that's got to be solved. Anyway, Jacob is an upset guy this day because he's finally gotten his airplane started. He has 10 minutes to get this huge 747 to the end of this fog-bound runway and get off the ground without running out of crew duty time. And here's the penalty. If he runs out, he's got to put everybody to bed at Las Palmas, buy $30,000 worth of hotel rooms and delays, and it's going to be very embarrassing. So he wants to go, and as they get the airplane down the field, they have to taxi down the runway about halfway because there are no taxiways stressed for a 747 at the first part. And then he has to turn around, get on a taxiway, come to the end, turn around, line up with the runway. They can only see about 300 yards into the fog. And as they line up, the first officer, who is very senior at KLM, but very junior to Jacob Van Zanten, and has never flown with Jacob before, and the second officer, who's very senior, at the airline as a second officer, hyphen flight engineer, but very junior to the first officer who's very junior to the captain. You get the hierarchy? As they get in position, the first officer co-pilot sees the captain's right hand coming forward on the throttles for these four huge JT-9D engines, 50,000 pounds thrust apiece. And he knows that they don't have a clearance to take off. On top of that, they don't have what's known as an air traffic control clearance to actually go over to Las Palmas. And he turns toward his commander with wide eyes and says, Sir, we don't have a takeoff clearance. And Jacob Van Zanten pulls the throttles back. And in the inimitable fashion that all of us who qualify as airline captains learn, he says, <clears throat> I knew that. <laughs> Get the clearance. First officer punches the button, talks to the tower, asks for the clearance. Clearance is read to him. He reads the clearance back. We have a little linguistic disconnect here because the guys in the KLM cockpit speak Dutch. That's their native language. And yet they're communicating by radio in a thing we call aviation English, which is kind of a stylized version of English. The fellow in the tower is Spanish, because this is a Spanish possession. He is trying to communicate in another language, aviation English. There are, is even an air crew on the field moving around out there who, according to my British friends, don't speak English at all. Pan American. Um, <laughs> I'm told we speak American. We don't speak English. At any rate, there is a linguistic disconnect. So when the first officer is finishing his readback and notices with increasing horror that the captain's hand is once again coming forward on the throttles, because they have now the air traffic control clearance, but they still don't have the physical clearance to take off. These are two separate clearances required. 
By the way, this guy is not a dummy. This is not a dumb individual. This is you or me sitting in that right seat. This is everybody in this room who has ever been in a position to see a senior individual doing something for the second time, and you got by with it first. You were well treated when you pointed it out the first time. Do you really want to tell them again that they're fouling up? He would like to find another way to do it. So the first officer, knowing that the captain is starting to take off roll without permission, keeps his finger on the transmit button and says, uh, and we are at takeoff, KLM 1422. The problem with this is that it doesn't make sense in aviation English. We are at takeoff, but as we want, as we are want to do as human beings, we fill in the blanks, don't we? You expect to hear something, and it's close, so you just go ahead and fill in the blanks. We are at takeoff. We are in takeoff position. Yeah, yeah, that'll work. That's what he means. We're in takeoff position. However, there's something wrong, and the tower controller is not really satisfied with this. And the controller presses his transmit button and says, OK, stand by, KLM. I will call you. But before he can get the second part of that phrase out, somebody else who's worried transmits. And the two transmissions cancel themselves out. And the only thing heard in the headsets of the KLM crew is the word OK. Set power, says Jacob. Vigo. Now the first officer's attention is entirely skewed to serving his commander as this big jet begins to roll forward into the fog. Five knots, 10 knots, 20 knots. There's another radio transmission out there someplace on the air patch. And the first officer and the captain are too busy with the takeoff roll to really pay attention to it. But the second officer, flight engineer, the guy who sits side saddle, he hears this and it worries him. And he leans forward at 35, 40 knots and says, is he not clear then, that Pan Am? 50 knots, 55 knots, 60 knots. What? Says Jacob. Huh? Says the first officer. 65 knots, 70 knots. Now in a more timorous voice, the second officer leans forward and says, is he not clear then, that Pan Am? 75 knots, 80 knots. Yes, says Jacob angrily, unhappy to be interrupted in the middle of his takeoff roll. Yes, echoes the first officer. And the second officer sits back, shuts up, says no more, 90 knots. 100, 105, 110, 112 knots, they finally come out of the wall of fog and they can see ahead. And what they can see is the worst thing an airline captain can possibly imagine. Another airplane sideways on the runway right in front of them. Pan Am had not left the runway yet. Van Zanten pulls the yoke into his chest as hard as he can. The airplane's nose comes off the ground. He beds the tail in the, in the concrete. 50 yards of sparks as the big bird begins to lift off the ground. It's 25 knots too slow, and yet he leaps it off the ground, and for a moment it looks like he's going to make it. The huge Pan Am logo slides past the left side of the peripheral vision of the cockpit. The nose gear passes safely over the back of Pan Am, but the body gear and the wing gear don't make it. They bite through the back of the structural integrity of the other 747. Its wings fall to the ground in flames. It comes apart. Came KLM's undercarriage is ripped away from it along with 40 knots and it falls back to the runway in flames and within 30 seconds 572 human beings lose their lives. 572. And what was our response in aviation? We had all feared a jumbo jet accident. But two of them together on the ground? But it wasn't that. It wasn't the horror of the numbers. It wasn't the impact of the fact that this happened on the ground or that it even happened to KLM and to Pan American, two of the best in the world. What got us was this simple fact. There was nothing mechanically wrong with any of those airplanes, either of those airplanes. There was no 39 cent light bulb we could blame. There was nothing to blame except the carbon-based units on board KLM. And that was our normal game, wasn't it? Just like healthcare. What do we do? We find the miscreant and we get rid of him or her. We, we take the action to make sure that individual can't do it again. Well, Jacob wasn't going to do it again. He was dead. But our problem here was very profound because in order to be able to chastise in absentia, to be able to say that our problem here was this bad pilot, this bad doctor, this bad nurse, we have to justify the fact that we're talking about the best and the brightest. We're talking about the chief pilot. As a matter of fact, when the call went out in Amsterdam from the CEO of the organization to, to get the director of safety and get him on board an airplane and send him to Tenerife. Remember the name now, Tenerife? When the call went out, the call came back within about five minutes and a, a, a subordinate with a shaking voice said to the CEO, Sir, w we can't do that. He says, why not? He says, because the director of safety's name was Jacob Van Zanten. We could not get by with this accident by simply saying that it was a bad captain, it was a bad pilot. We had, to, we had to recognize the fact that we had a systemic problem. 
The information that could have saved 572 people and two airplanes was sitting right there in the right seat. Sitting right there in the right seat, second row. They knew. The second officer knew. Twice he tried to warn. But because of the hierarchy, because of the systemic inability to pass the information from those who had it to those who needed it, how many times has this happened in healthcare? But the idea was that the new guy, or the new gal, is not going to know anything. And yet that's the person who's usually got the best point of view. We didn't know anything about this.